life has many ways of testing a person's will, either by having nothing happen at all or by having everything happen all at once. This is uh, a quote by Paulo Coelho. It is said that one finds out the most about themselves in the midst of trials and hardships. And never has this been more true for an entrepreneur and more so for an entrepreneur that's navigating this current pandemic. Today, we have three amazing entrepreneurs joining us for our first installment of Entrepreneurship in Crisis. The goal of this series is to speak to entrepreneurs navigating different industries through this pandemic, to have them share their stories and to listen to some of their uh, strategies and tips that they are currently engaging. We will also be speaking to the Director of Business Outreach as to get some resources and tips in, in terms of how we can move forward uh, in this very difficult time. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, first up, we will have Meg Dillagrange, and I'll just read a short bio from Meg. Uh, as an Amish-born single mother with over 22 moves between New York and Tokyo, the life of Meg Dillagrange has been different than most. Meg has risen above prejudices and different difficult circumstances with a tenacity that turns her challenges into inspiration. Through constantly exploring new ideas and using the work ethic from her background, Meg has created a unique tool set to help businesses grow. Most recently, she took the brand she co-founded from 45 sales to a million sales in just three years, before the brand was successfully purchased by another company. When Meg isn't working with her clients, you may find her painting in her studio or sharing heart-to-heart -heart thoughts on Instagram. Welcome, Meg. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm just so excited that there are people in the world who are focused on nurturing other people and giving value and giving information. And um, so thank you for having me. And um, thank you for the introduction. And I really just wanted to make this as valuable for anyone joining as possible. And so I really pulled some notes together. I tend to move quickly and talk quickly and go over points quickly. So I also need to slow myself down because sometimes I just rip through something and your head's spinning. Um, so I look forward to your questions at the end if you wanna hear more about my story or more about any of the points that I'm sharing. But interestingly enough, uh, in my bio, you heard that I'm a single mother and I was born Amish, really coming from a different background, an uneducated background. And so this is not the first time that I have been in crisis as an entrepreneur. So I've been a single mother for seven years now. And interestingly enough, the struggles and challenges that I'm facing right now, the uncertainty in entrepreneurship now are very similar to becoming a single mother for the first time seven years ago. And I'm able to have, I guess, the privilege of looking back and seeing how I moved forward from, um, just to give you a picture, to having, to being a college student seven years ago and doing janitorial work, cleaning houses, um, to getting a job with an agency and then co-founding a company to getting to where I am now. And there are about three main things that helped me grow and overcome seven years ago and things that are helping me grow and overcome right now. And so those are like the three things that I wanna share with you. Um, the first thing that I believe I had seven years ago that I didn't really realize that I had was I had a profit mindset. So I was profit minded, meaning um, that means a couple things. Um, and I didn't know, I didn't have the language for this, but I immediately knew that I needed to live below my means, which was kind of laughable at that time because my bills were so much more than my income every month. But I went ahead and I made a budget. I went ahead and I put structure in place 
so that even though like it, it was almost like I was thinking long term and I was thinking ahead, I knew that I wasn't always going to be in these circumstances, even though um, I hadn't owned my own business before, um, I hadn't really, I had been a stay at home wife for almost 10 years. So that's a really long time to really not have a career and then end up as a single mother and need to have a career. But with this profit mindedness, I had this mindset of progress over perfection. I had a mindset of every day today is a day that I have to move the needle forward. If I don't have the, if I don't move the needle forward today for myself, no one else is going to do it for me. And so every single day, there were creative things that I started doing. Um, there were a lot of different things I started doing, but I had to move the needle forward, meaning I had to do something to create an income or submit a job application or, you know, every single day there was some little step that I could take to move my needle forward. Um, then I... I was already active on social media. And so I, um, another way that I was profit minded is even though I didn't realize that social media was going to end up playing a huge role in the upcoming years, I was online just sharing value, sharing inspiration. Um, I was essentially distributing content everywhere, which is a term that we've learned to know from marketers like Gary Vee. Um, but that's something that I was doing seven years ago. It's something I'm still doing today. Even if, even if it's something that isn't directly related to profit for me, if it adds value to people's lives, I really focus on distributing value um, to people. It's also something that I'm currently teaching my clients um, who are struggling. Um, we're all struggling with some, you know, I've definitely struggled with loneliness and uncertainties and new bills and income challenges that I wasn't facing before because um, right before this pandemic hit, my I'm in Nashville and my city had a tornado and my house was hit a little bit. And so I need a new roof right now. So I'm facing some interesting challenges but my clients are facing challenges as well. And what I'm finding that's helping both of us is to continue to have a profit mindset and know that, and just focus on distributing content out, distributing value, and really, I guess, living from a place of abundance, not lack, even though we're feeling that pinch of lack right now. So profit-mindedness has been big for me. Um, Creating structure has been another huge thing for me. Um, and by creating structure, I mean a good morning routine. Uh, seven years ago, I started getting up at five o'clock every morning, even though I didn't have a job. I didn't actually have a reason to get up at 5 a.m. every morning. I was just insanely obsessive with personal growth at the time. Um, I somehow had the self-awareness to look at my life and see that if I was ending up in divorce and ending up in dire circumstances where I had nothing and I had no education and I had no idea how to make it forward, I just began consuming the content of successful people and I paid attention to the habits of successful people. And I began to implement those even though I didn't have a job. And then I had three jobs and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> there were a couple of different ways that I structured my life. I had a good morning routine. I created the budget, as I said before, and I started, I was exercising every day, just disciplining myself. I guess I really knew that I had no time for apathy if I was going to help myself do better. And so it's the same thing now, even to even today to get through the pandemic, I'm disciplining myself and creating that structure. The last thing that has really helped me to advance and succeed in the past seven years, and this is really unique to me, this might not apply to you, but it's been to learn good marketing 
and learn how to nurture relationships, learning how to meet the needs of people. Um, when you learn good marketing, you will then be paying attention to trends. You will be paying attention to needs in the marketplace and you will much more easily be able to shift and meet those needs. Um, for just two examples, um, one of my clients actually shifted her offerings and began sewing masks. Within 24 hours, she sold out of her first batch of masks that she sold or that she sewed and she's been sewing ever since. So she shifted to meet a need in the marketplace. Another client of mine um, owned a spray tanning business and she also had a self tanner that she sold online. Well, when the pandemic hit, she shifted from doing in-person events and in-person sessions to really creating ads and creating partnerships to sell the self tanner online. And she just told me that she's had her highest grossing 30 days. Um, I believe 47,000 in the past 30 days and her highest grossing month before that had been 16,000, which was really good. Um, so just pivoting and learning how to speak the language of your client, which is a very niche way, your customer speaking their language. Those are just really effective ways that I have or effective that has helped me be effective, um, to learn to speak, to solve people's problems. There are actually seven um, core motivations and seven types of problems that every human being has. And so I study those and I help my clients know what those are for their people. And I kind of, and I know what they are for my clients. And so when you're here to serve people well, which is what I think good marketing is, I think you're always going to make it through anything and thrive through anything. So, um, Antonavia, I don't, I didn't look exactly at my time when I started talking, and I really don't want to go over ten minutes. I'm sorry. I don't know if we have a signal for when we're at. Um, I think we'll just pass to the next person. I'm so sorry, you're, you're muted. Antonavia, you're muted. You're muted, Antonavia. Yeah. Yeah, so, so sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, I'm sorry about that. Thank you. We should have hand signals. Um, thank you so much, Meg. Uh, I think that was invaluable information. Um, next up, we have Michael Quinn. Yep. Oh, Michael, thank you for joining us. Um, thank let me you, read everyone. a short bio on Michael. Uh, mm -hmm. Michael is currently the founder and co-owner and chief engagement officer of Feltman's of Coney Island, which is an historic food brand supplying premium hot dogs and mustard products to over 2,000 supermarkets nationwide, as well as restaurants, arenas, hotels, and airports. Uh, uh, Feltman's also sells their products via e-commerce on Amazon, Jet.com, and directly via Feltman's of Coney Island.com. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for having me. How's everyone doing? Um, I know it's on mute. They can't answer me. But I'm just happy to be here. This is just wonderful. Just an extra thing I get to do being stuck here in my apartment in New York City. But uh, I'd like to uh, just kind of give a little background um, of myself and also uh, my business, which actually goes back to the 1860s, um, the Feltman's name and brand and, and business. But I am an alumnus of uh, St. Francis College, and I went to St. Francis College in the early to mid 90s. Um, now, if anyone remembers those years, the Clinton years, uh, the economy, this is the, you know, the advent of the um, internet, and the economy was just booming. I mean, I remember graduating and there were you know, giving out, literally giving out jobs on Wall Street, you know, on street corners. It was that good in the economy during that time period. But, um, 
But anyway, I, I grew up in, um, I'm a Coney Island native and historian. I grew up in, in Southern Brooklyn and um, I had two younger brothers and, and as young boys, we always wanted to start a business together. You know, that was something we always had a desire to do. Uh, tragically, my, uh, one of my younger brothers died on 9-11 and my surviving brother was a West Point grad. He did 10 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I always had this interest in bringing back this Feltman's name. Now, I don't know if anyone, too many people know the history of, of Feltman's, but the, our founder, Charles Feltman, invented the hot dog back in 1867 um, from a pie wagon at Coney Island. And um, about 10, 15, 20 years later, um, he had the largest, most extravagant restaurant in the world. And um, my grandfather was um, a patron there, and he happened to be able to get the recipe from Feltman's Hot Dogs, which I had since 1992. So I had this unique recipe that I had no idea what to do with for years. Um, when my brother came back from war, we decided in memory of our grandfather and our brother that we lost to revive this historic hot dog brand. Now, at the time I was working um, as a teacher and I was doing history tours and things like that. And I decided, so you know what? Let me just go all in on this. So I started very small, very humbly. I was doing um, you know, the, the gentrified areas of Brooklyn. I was doing pop-ups with the hot dogs and I was selling them in you know, little beer gardens and places like that. And of course, family members looked at me like, what are you crazy? You have a master's degree, you're educated. You decided to sell hot dogs. So we, um, and then there was, uh, I opened up my little takeout window in, in the East Village, New York. Um, a gentleman by the name of Lork and Otway, amazing place called um, the Museum of the American Gangster at Theater 80. So I started with this little takeout window and I'm selling hot dogs. Here I am in my, you know, just turned 40 maybe, and I'm selling hot dogs out of this little window. But by day five, uh, Gothamist wrote, behind this tiny window was New York City's best hot dog. And then from there, it ended up, you know, New York Magazine. And it was just, the, the acclaim was just incredible, the, you know. But here I am, you know, just selling these products. And then all of a sudden, I get, you know, someone approaches me and say, hey, I own this butcher shop. Can, can you package them? And then another person asked me. So all of a sudden, I, I started to, you know what, maybe I'm better off selling the branded product as opposed to running these little um these little, uh, this little kitchen window and doing pop-ups. And then eventually we were able to bring uh, Feltman's back uh, to Coney Island um, for a couple of seasons at the original location where Feltman's restaurant was, was located. And then um, right now we're at a point where we're just, uh, we're, like I said, thousands of supermarkets. And it was an interesting transition. And I feel very fortunate, especially what's going on, the, the current situation that I don't have overhead, that we are selling them and, and we're kind of an essential product. You know, the, the product itself, the, the hot dogs are, uh, you know, packaged. Um, we're in, again, uh, you know, Whole Foods, we're in um, arenas, we're in, you know, all these different restaurants, but it even, you know, it's just all over the country. So it's just, and on the online sales have just been also a saving point. So, and, you know, from a marketing perspective, you know, we're, we're, very sensitive right now, very sensitive as far as how we approach today with the brand. I'm talking about since the, uh, the pandemic uh, started a month ago, because, you know, we are, we are doing pretty well, you know, but the important thing is strategically is to be ahead of the curve. And as a team, the Feltman's team, we kind of looked at the worst case scenario. You always have to look at the worst case scenario. And you always have to plan for that to survive. And, you know, I'm talking about like over a month ago, we saw what was happening. We decided right away, we're buying 120,000 pounds of beef. We're going to store it separately just in case there is a shortage. And we're starting to see that there may be a, a shortage. Um, we started to um, produce every single day. Even if there's not a PO, every sing right now we're producing hot dogs. So... You know, I don't know how many other uh, companies kind of have that, you know, uh, that hindsight, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it was very important that we did that. And then from a marketing perspective, we have a, a, a program right now. If you go to our website, Uh we have a, a care package program. 
So what we're doing right now, you can nominate someone, uh, someone who works in a hospital, a nurse or a doctor, who you think deserves a free care pack uh, from Feltman's. Um, and also, you know, we're sending out on our own uh, care packs to first responders, um, you know, to people that work in hospitals, uh, to, you know, the FDNY, the NYPD. Um, so it's kind of what we're doing right now, because you have to be very, very careful from a marketing perspective right now, not to, you know, to toot your own horn right now that you're doing well. And, um, and I think that's very important as far as, as far as that's concerned. And, um, you know, we, we, we're trying to predict what's going to happen next. What's our summer going to be like? Cause like the past month, this has like been like July. So what's, what's going to happen when summer now, you know, is there going to be a growing season? You know, now a lot of these places now that we're, we're selling out. I mean, I'm sure, I don't know how many people have been visiting supermarkets. Hot dogs have been like, you know, usually what we, we, uh, we get a PO a month for each supermarket chain, you know, they've been selling out every two to three days. So that's why, you know, we, we have to really ramp up production. Uh, we really, um, right now, I think it's been about, you know, our, our sales, I, I like to use percentage, gone, gone up about 200%. You know, I, I feel like, you know, what we usually do in sales per month, month and a half, we've been doing per week. So, um, and, you know, it can be challenging, you know, it can be challenging, but I'm very fortunate. Um, my brother, who's a, a, a partner in the business, he's, um, like I said, a West Point grad. We hire the core of my company, Feltman's of Coney Island are army guys and they're very good at operations, you know, chain of command. Um, you know, they have the essential tools and talents to, to run a business like this. Um, my brother just was just started as CEO of Feltman's on Monday. Um, I focus more on, you know, having CEO of the engagement officer. So I do more of that type of, uh, of, um, of work right now. But, uh, but it's really been an, an interesting ride up to this point. And um, it's exciting. And it's really brought us this whole pandemic just with so close and tight knit. Like this Zoom has been my job full time. <laughs> so we have meetings all through the day, whether it's the, the supermarket buyers, with, whether it's, it's um, you know, the, the members of the Feltman's team with my publicists, with, you know. So, and it's just, it, it forced us to be a tighter, um, you know, just well-oiled machine. So, you know, we talk about silver linings. I mean, I think it, it's, it's been great for us, but I just don't want this to go on for too long, <laughs> even though we're doing well. I kind of do want to have a somewhat of a summer because th this, it is our, our business. You know, it's a seasonal business hot dogs, obviously, you know? So it's something that, um, that I'm, you know, I'm hoping eventually will, will come to end like we always, like all of us do. So. Thank you. So I don't know if that was 10 minutes or you. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have Melissa Manning. Welcome, Melissa. Uh, Melissa Hi. is a serial entrepreneur who has started 13 businesses in eight years. Uh, she currently has two coffee shops, a bar, restaurant, a yoga studio, a coaching agency, and an inspirational platform for entrepreneurs. Her mission is to use the tools and techniques she's learned over the last eight years to support, inspire, and encourage other existing and budding entrepreneurs on their journey. Hi, Melissa. Hi. So I just want to say hi to everyone and thank you all so much for being here. Thank you everyone from SFC and Tenavia for putting this together. This is awesome. Um, so a little bit about me. I grew up in Long Island and then I moved to Virginia and as soon as I moved to Virginia I said I need to get back to New York so I was able to get myself a scholarship to SFC and I graduated in 2010 so 10 years ago 10 short years ago it went so fast um, and so pretty much as soon I mean, even in middle school, middle school, high school, I was always reading and learning about entrepreneurship. Um, I had a lot of restaurant jobs and, and uh, retail jobs and office jobs. And I always knew that I was not someone who could work for someone else my entire life. I knew that those were temporary, um, that if I was working for someone else, that it had to be temporary because that was not something that I could do for my 
for my entire life. So um, when I was in high school and when I was in college, I was always reading real estate books. I thought that I would be a real estate tycoon. And so as soon as I graduated, I was able to get a full-time job. Naomi got me this job at Fidesa. Uh, I don't know if she remembers that. She's placed so many people. And um, I had a great salary, great benefits. And I was able to, with my partner at the time, we were able to buy our first investment property. So this was 2011. I purchased my first investment property and it's a three family property in Brooklyn. And so that's sort of when the whole thing really materialized my entire life. I was planning businesses, furniture designer, um, clothing designer, um, real estate tycoon. I was planning all of these businesses and all of these things that I would create. And so it finally, finally started with that first property. Um, so we started that property. Then we purchased another one the next year. Then we, I opened with my partner and his brother, we had opened a children's store in Brooklyn. And so it went every, just about every year I was opening a new business and they were always different. Um, I opened an art studio complex. I, well, two of them actually. And then a coffee shop, a real estate office, um, a wine bar. And so currently, like Antonavia said, currently I have two active coffee shops. I have um, a bar restaurant that I just opened in 2019. So that was the newest, freshest, most vulnerable business that I had right now. Um, and I have a yoga studio that is currently still operating. Thank God um, we're operating via Zoom as you can imagine. Um, and we're, we're doing about half of the revenue that we had been doing. Um, actually we're doing way less than that, to be honest, we're doing, let's see, we're doing probably about a third of the revenue that we were doing. So it's really stressful. And actually this is the first thing that I kind of want to talk about in terms of just dealing with this situation is that I want to acknowledge anybody else in this group here that does have their own uh, business or side hustle or freelance or whatever it is that they're doing, I want to acknowledge the fear and the panic that we all are feeling right now because especially as a business owner, as somebody who is responsible for yourself, maybe your family, like Meg, I have a daughter, I'm a single mother, um, so I'm responsible for myself, for my daughter, and then for all of the employees that work for me, I have more than 50 employees. And so the fear and the panic that is coming up when all of this stuff is happening is just, even just talking about it right now, I'm getting physically emotional. So it's something that like, if you guys are still feeling that, it's okay. It's, I acknowledge that because it's something that we're all feeling. And as a leader too, it's something that you, Sometimes people expect you not to be susceptible to that. They expect you to be strong enough to not feel that. And that's not, that's not possible. We're still human and we still feel that fear and that panic. So I think the first thing is kind of being able to harness that in a way and like deal with that and sort of get a grip on that intense emotion that I'm sure you're feeling and figure out how to just sort of hold it in a way that you can move forward. And like Meg said, move the needle somehow during this time. Um, so one of the things that I keep telling myself is just take it day by day. Because for me, I get very frustrated if I'm not feeling progress every day. Like if I don't, if I go, you know, a whole eight hours or more during the day and I don't feel like that needle has been moved, that bothers me. But during this time, come on, like we can only do so much. We can only control so much. So right now I think it's just don't put more pressure on yourself. I heard something on Instagram the other day. It was a video that somebody put on their Instagram where a mother was calling in feeling guilty because she was letting her son watch TV. And that was the only time she had peace during the day. And this woman um, who she called got almost angry with her because she was like, woman, relax. 
We're in a crisis. Take it easy on yourself. Do what you need to do to get through this. You know, like if, if the only way to get peace is to put your son in front of the TV for two hours, do it. It's not going to hurt him. So same thing. If you're not a parent, that's okay. Same thing with your business, with all of your responsibilities. Just don't add more pressure onto yourself. Right now, this is a crazy, crazy moment. We don't know what's going to happen from now until tomorrow. Honestly, even by 6 p.m. tonight, things could change. Like, it's, it's so tumultuous that it's not worth adding more pressure to yourself. Do what you can. Pat yourself on the back. Take a breath. Drink a martini. And, and do what you can within reason to move the needle forward. The second thing I want to say is that this time, as crazy as it is and as scary as it is and as, as much fear as we feel, there's a lot of opportunity here. This is when the new, like, awesome startups start. Airbnb, Uber, Venmo, more. There's more. There's a bunch more from 2008 until now. That's when those started. That's when I was able to buy my first investment property because of 2008. The market was still low enough that I, with my measly 50 grand a year, could buy a three-family property in Brooklyn that's now worth over a million dollars. Like, that doesn't, ha that, you couldn't do that two months ago. You couldn't. You needed to buy that house. You would have needed to have like 300 grand saved up or more or something like that. Now you don't. Now you can buy that investment property. Now you can start a business because you can get the labor, sorry everyone, but like you can get the labor at a discount. You can get stuff that you wouldn't normally be able to afford or you wouldn't normally be able to um, like find at a discounted rate. You can now get it at a discounted rate. Now is the time that people are searching for solutions. There are opportunities here. For me, my business, I was stuck in my ways. I was stuck in my ways. I was doing things that weren't efficient. But now I have the time to reanalyze everything. I can reanalyze, do I even want to be running a coffee shop? I don't know. Do I? This bar restaurant has been the hardest business that I've ever started in my entire life. And I know Michael knows about that because he used to run it through a little window. So like, the food business is so hard. It's so much harder than I expected it to be, this bar restaurant. Is that what I want to continue doing? Do I want to put more of my money into it to work harder every single day? I don't know. And now this is giving me the opportunity to analyze all of those things and, and kind of just re-decide what I want for myself, my future, my family, my daughter, um, do I want to live in New York? Do I want to live somewhere else? It's, it's giving me that opportunity to readjust and create a new vision for my entire life. And not only that, I mean, so much of the time we have these great ideas. Like we probably have a great idea a day and we don't even notice it because we're so used to not taking action. But now is the opportunity that when you have that idea, write it down and just take five minutes. You don't got anything else to do. Take five minutes and figure out, could I do something with that idea? Michael had a hot dog idea and he made this crazy big company. You know, it's like you could have the smallest idea that you could never imagine becoming a multi-million or even a billion dollar company. And look at Meg, she started with this small company and she grew it into over a million dollars. Like we can do this with, with all of these little ideas. Now we have the time. So consider those ideas that you knew were good. You knew it was a good idea, but you were like, nah, ain't got the time. Now you've got the time and you might be able to find the money. You might be able to find the money. If that business that you were running, you just can't reopen it, get those loans from the state, from the government. Get the loans that you can get and put it towards this new idea. 
or adjust your business. Like, like they've already said, pivot, adjust your business, adjust your offerings, find something new to create. If my friend has a knitting company and she's here knitwise, she created this knit. This is the perfect time. You guys, we're sitting here eight, 10, 12 hours a day, twiddling our thumbs. We could be knitting some sweaters. You know what I mean? Um, and then, <laughs> is that 10? <laughs> <laughs> Roughly, do you have any closing? I just have one last thing. So the other thing is just, and, and again, Meg mentioned this, so I just want to hit on that again, is just keep your mind strong. Don't sit and watch Netflix all day. Of course, give yourself a break, watch some Netflix. The society is really good, but you know, keep your mind strong, read books that are inspiring you, watch videos that are inspiring you come to these kind of talks that for sure have to be inspiring to you. So like, keep doing that. The routine, if it's running, if that's what like gets you kind of pumped up and going, do that, read, watch videos. Um, like just, keep your mind strong and keep your mind looking for the new opportunities. Um, I feel like I got real excited there. So <laughs> thank you guys for listening. <laughs> thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you so much. Um, uh, next up, so we've heard from our three amazing entrepreneurs. Uh, next up, we're gonna hear from Deshaun Mars. Uh, Deshaun is the Director of Business Outreach at the New York City Department of Small Business Services. Uh, in, in this role, Deshaun leads the outreach team's efforts on behalf of the agency to engage with entrepreneurs, business owners, community-based organizations, and chambers of commerce throughout New York City. Prior to his work in city government, Deshaun held a number of different roles in the education and nonprofit sectors at the Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation, Good, oh, Good Shepherd Services, and Teach for America, New York. Deshaun is also a proud New Yorker, born and raised in Brooklyn. Welcome, Deshaun. Thank you, thank you. And I don't know why you have me going last to follow all those inspirational entrepreneurs, <laughs> but that was amazing. Not sure if I can be as inspirational as the business owners and, and entrepreneurs. So I'm gonna be the, the boring government official talking about the resources that are available from New York City. But I really, really appreciate everything that was shared beforehand. This is the opportunity to pivot. We heard from Melissa, from Meg, from Michael, and they talked about this is the opportunity now to potentially sell online. You might have been thinking about that business idea that you had no time to try to actualize and do some planning around. Maybe this is the opportunity. So what I'm going to do today, I'll talk a little bit about the work that we do at the agency, just to give you some context about all the resources that we have at the New York City Department of Small Business Services. I'll also talk a little bit about how we've been shifting our operations. Now, city government, our agency, we are not entrepreneurs, we are not businesses, but we've also had to think strategically about how do we shift our operations to do things differently? Because we have a lot of people that are counting on city government to make sure that the resources are available to support our entrepreneurs and business owners. So I'll talk a little bit about how we're shifting things ourselves to better serve New Yorkers. So our agency, not sure if everyone has heard about what we do at SBS, but we are the government agency, your city resource to help you start, operate and grow your business. So no matter if you are an entrepreneur and you've been thinking about that business idea, but you're not quite sure how to get it off the ground, we have free business courses that you can take around what are the first steps to actually starting your business. We know that everyone who has a business, you need a business plan. Included in your business plan, you need financing. So we have a number of different courses and resources to help you get started. After you've gotten your business plan, you've been thinking about your financing, maybe you're thinking about what type of corporation should I have? Should I be an LLC? Should I be a sole proprietorship? Should I be an S Corp? We have lawyers that can work with you at no cost to help you in officially incorporate your business. 
So no matter what resource you need to get your business up and moving, you can come to the city for those resources. If you are currently operating a business, and again, if you're looking for financing, we have lenders all throughout New York City that you can work with, but you might be thinking about partnering with New York City to actually sell your services to city government. A lot of people don't know this, but city government, we actually buy a lot of our services. So you might be a manufacturer, you could be a restaurant, maybe you can cater some things for different city agencies. So we'll work with current business owners to help connect them to opportunities to contract with New York City. So that's a good opportunity for any of the students or anyone who has a business in, in New York City. There's an opportunity for you to grow your business by working with New York City. So I mentioned the financing, I mentioned contracting with New York City. If you are opening up a brick and mortar space, so that means an actual physical location in a commercial space. We have lawyers through a commercial lease assistance program that can help you negotiate your lease, can help you think about the terms of your lease. And then for anyone, so no, Melissa talked about running a restaurant and a bar. There's so much that actually goes into running a business out of a physical space. So we actually have a team at the agency that can walk you through interacting with any of the other city agencies that you have to work with if you have a brick and mortar commercial space. So there are a number of resources starting from business courses that you can take all the way up until you may need to work with a different city agency and you're not quite sure what all the new rules and regulations are. Those are all some different things that the agency can provide you. Now, pre-coronavirus and pre this epidemic that we're in right now, we have over 25 walk-in centers that are both business solution centers where you can get business services. So again, any of those business ideas that you're thinking about, we have local centers where you used to be able to just walk in and talk to one of our staff members about your business and what resources you're looking for. In addition, we also have workforce career centers for anyone who's looking for employment. Another part of our agency is connecting people to employment. So we have over 25 of those workforce career centers and business solution centers all throughout New York City. But because of the coronavirus, we aren't doing our in-person consultations anymore. So we've shifted online. So for anyone here who's looking for employment, you can go on our website, nyc.gov sbs. And I'll make sure that we put that into the chat box. But we're actually doing consultations online. So if you want to connect with any of our staff members and think through your resume, talk about what your skill set is, talk about who's hiring in New York City, we're still operating, albeit we're doing everything that we're doing online. Now, I just want to point to a couple of things that I heard the entrepreneur said earlier, which really stuck a chord with me. So I heard pivoting, I heard the word adjust a lot. So we've had to pivot our operations. So a lot of our work, my team, we do external affairs, we do outreach, we are out in the field, hosting events, doing presentations, talking to business owners and organizations about how they can get connected to resources from the city. We obviously can't do that in person now, but our team, we've been on so many webinars over the last couple of weeks, so I'm starting to play around with my lighting in my place, trying to figure out all my angles for my Zoom. But we've had to shift our operations to make sure that we're still able to serve New Yorkers. So that's one small thing that we're doing. Michael talked about a, uh, always having a plan and thinking through the worst case scenario. I'm gonna highlight one program from the agency that can be useful for any of our business owners and entrepreneurs here. So with the coronavirus, an emergency, your business had to shut down. So you might be thinking, what do I need to have in place so I can continue to operate? So that might be shifting your operations online so you can still generate some revenue. That might be shifting what your business plan is and doing something maybe a little different during this time. But no matter what the emergency is, you need to make sure that you're always prepared. So we have a program where if there's any business disruption, 
we have a program to help set you up so that you're prepared for that next disruption. Now you might be thinking, what's a disruption? It could be a global pandemic that we're experiencing now. It could be Superstorm Sandy a couple of years ago where a number of businesses had to close. 9-11, a lot of businesses had to close after 9-11. But it also could be a fire in your place of business. What if there was a water main break on your block and you need to shut down the business? So then there's no more foot traffic and you need to shut your doors for a, for a period of time. We have a program that can help prepare you for those next emergencies. So for anyone who currently has a business, you can come to the city and we'll help you with your emergency planning because we're seeing now that if you aren't able to shift online or you're not an essential business, that your revenues are dropping considerably. So we wanna make sure that you can put some things in place in case another disruption happens. Last thing, for, I know Melissa, I believe you talked about some of the funding and loans and financing that are available right now. For any current business owners, the federal government has a number of different programs to help you get through this time. So one is a paycheck protection program. So for anyone who employs staff, there's a program where you can get help with your payroll costs. There's also some funding for an economic injury disaster. So if you need to shut your business down for a period of time, the federal government also has some loans that are available. Now, things are very, very hectic, both at the city and the federal government level. So I know a lot of people are applying for unemployment. They're applying for the financial resources that are available but the system is oversubscribed now because there are so many people that are applying for all of these different programs. So the one thing I'm telling folks, you need to be patient, but you also need to be very persistent. So I'll make sure people here have my direct contact information. Remember, you need to be patient because there are so many people that are applying for these benefits and applying for all of these programs, but you need to make sure that you're persistent and that you're getting what you need. So just think of New York City, think of myself, think about us as resources to help you get through this time. But just know that there are a number of resources that are out there. The city has been shifting our operations to make sure that we can accommodate what you all need as the business community. So we are here as a resource. Our agency is here as a resource. I'm here, our team is here, but you can still get access to all the resources at SBS to help you start your business and to help you grow and expand so that we can get through this time in a much better place. Oh yes, thank you so much, Deshaun. Um, we've had a lot of really valuable information so far. And before we're gonna take a poll, we're gonna take a poll in just a minute, but I just wanted to reiterate, much like Deshaun did, but go over several points that our speakers that have, have brought up so far that I think are really, really, really important. Um, the, I think one of the most important ones we heard uh, for the day, uh, Meg started off with shifting to meet the needs of the market and how very, very important it is to pivot. That's one of the things that continuously come up, the ability to be able to move with the market and to continue to innovate. Uh, the, one of the other things that came up, we need to develop daily structures and routines, especially in a time that has taken away our normal routines from us. We need to make sure that we maintain those daily routines if we wanna be able to navigate this crisis. Uh, as Melissa said, give yourself a break. Take time to reevaluate your vision. Give yourself a break and take time to reevaluate your vision. Michael, what stuck out with me, Michael, when you said <laughs> you hired um, Army veterans? Yes. Uh, that it was so, it stuck out to me because it said you were hiring the right people for the job in terms of what mm -hmm. you were like, they, you, you, you spoke about their qualities and how that applies yes. specifically to your business. And I think that's mm -hmm. one of the most important things that you can do is make sure you hire the right persons with the right tool sets. Um, it might help with frustration in the long run. <laughs> yeah, I just feel, you know, for me right now, what's most important to my business is the partnerships. Yes. Not only, you know, we have about a dozen core members, team members at Feltman's and like me, they treat this like a religion. They're just, this is big, eat and breathe this business, every aspect of it. Yep. And those are the people you need. It's not all about you in the beginning. It's just me. 
and also our partners, some of these supermarket chains. We have some really good partners and really partners that are not great at all, that don't help us. So it's just that partnership and having people on board that have that same passion and that same focus Investment. that you have. That's, yeah. that's, that's the whole thing for me right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the things that Deshaun mentioned that stuck out to me was patience and persistence. Um, especially since we're all indoors right now, it is so terribly difficult to be patient. And sometimes, you know, you're tired of being persistent. You just want it to move already. And uh, so I think those two are also key if we're going to move uh, through this time into a better time. To open, uh, I think you guys have already been asking and answering questions in the chat box. Um, yeah, yes, uh, Naomi? May I ask a quick, well, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone for such wonderful career, sharing career and life advice and insights. It's great to see <laughs> Melissa and Michael again and learning from Deshaun and Meg as well. I, I actually um, wondered, Deshaun, ironically, as you were talking, I received an email from the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership with Tyler Woods. Do you work with him by any chance? So we, we do work very closely with the, so they're one of our business improvement districts. Okay. And yeah, yeah. So I don't work directly with, with Tyler, but we do work with the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Because they're offering an office virtual tour for students that are wanting to learn about various uh, industries as well as entrepreneurship. And I thought, what a, how ironic that this <laughs> message came up and you were talking about that. But also, um, just hang in there, everyone. I think most successes come from taking risks. And I always tell students interested in entrepreneurship that, you know, it's a learning process like any position. And we're all starting out with that learning curve. And it's important to have that confidence that might vacillate sometimes. But having people in your corner, the right support mechanisms, and the faith that things will get better. I think, and that positive attitude will keep everyone going and shining and growing and delivering and performing. So I just wanted to thank you so much, uh, also Antoneva for organizing this. It's really helpful to learn from you all and great to see so many familiar faces too. Thank you, Naomi. Okay, just, I wanted to just go over, uh, one question that was asked that I just want to reiterate is, okay. One moment. I think Taylor asked, it's uh, how to keep up your confidence during this time. Uh, and uh, Melissa responded, it's, it's so important to keep your confidence up around your business, even if you have doubts, because you must remain your number one cheerleader. Uh, no one will believe in your business as much as you, and no one will believe it if you don't. Um, and she mentions that she keeps her confidence up by listening, reading to motivational media. Uh, and do not put any negative messages into your mind. So if you have a chance, take a quick look at the chat box, if you haven't already done so, to see the questions that have been asked there. Uh, are there any other questions that anyone would like to ask? Let me put this to the side. Okay, so I'd like to take a moment to thank our presenters today. Thank you. It, the, I'm so grateful that you decided that this was important enough to take time out of your day to do this. We would like to continue this conversation in our next two installments. Uh, next week, we're gonna take a dive into how the supply chain has been affected um, in the product and service industry alike. We're gonna listen to our entrepreneurs from non-traditional uh, sectors as they continue to innovate their way through this crisis as well. So we'll be speaking to international and local entrepreneurs next week as we continue the conversation. The third installment, will be, which is the following week, we'll be speaking to student entrepreneurs to find out how they are navigating the current crisis. So thank you presenters for being with us today. The information has been invaluable. Uh, I just... Also, I'd like to take a moment to thank the 
bar president's office who also had someone else on hand to offer additional resources if anyone uh, needs it. Um, the St. Francis College Government and Community Relations Office, uh, Special Events Office, the Center for Entrepreneurship, and uh, St. Francis College uh, Innovate, and everybody else that really helped make this possible. We know it's important for the community. If you have any suggestions or ideas on how to improve this or add to what this is, please uh, feel free to, to email us at innovate, uh, wow, S wow, innovate at sfc.edu. I blanked for a moment there. Um, so thank you so much, and we hope to see you joining in next week as well. I just want to leave you with a quote as well as we started with one. Your hardest times often lead to the greatest moments of your life. Keep going. Tough situations build strong people in the end.